Hello, my friends. I'm Humberto Fernandez, and welcome to this second edition of the AIH podcast, the podcast where we take a look to everything that is going on in the Riviera Maya from a real estate perspective. And with me, as always, is Alejandro. Hello, Alex. How are you doing? Good morning. Hi, Humberto. Good morning. Really well here in the Riviera Maya. How's everything back in Canada? Everything back in Canada is awesome. Actually, we're starting to get the higher temperatures, no more snow. Sounds great overall. Today, we're going to be discussing two different subjects that I believe that are going to be very interesting for you. The first thing is kind of uh, something that happens very much every now and then, I would say, in real life. And those are the concerns that people that is going to buy a property in Mexico, the concerns that they experience about the deliveries on pre-sale. Just to give a little context, uh, the Riviera Maya, I would say that is, is a market that is rolled by pre-sales. I mean, for every, uh, if, if you can divide the market, you're going to see that maybe 70 to up to 80%, maybe all of those are pre-sales and you would have like a 20, 25% of resales. So that means that the entry ticket for many people in order to buy a property in, in the Mexican Caribbean has to do with pre-sales. And whenever you get into buying a pre-sale, you're going to sign your promise of sale contract. And you're going to start, start having concerns as for what happens if the, uh, the developer do not deliver on time or according to the specifications. So I would like to start just by Alex. Can you quote any example of that or to, to your, to your memory? Have you been through that? Through what? Through, uh, the process of pre-sale? Is that what you mean? No, the process in which a pre-sale is supposed to be delivered and it's not delivered either on time or according to specifications that you need to step up for the client, for the buyer and kind of sort the situation? That's a great question. So, because that's the main concern with people, right? I'm going to buy a pre-sale. I have to trust in a developer that I don't know a lot, right? I have to trust the, that the agent knows him, but I don't know the agent that well either, right? I would say 70% of the times there's minor issues. You know what I mean? If they say they're going to deliver on January the 1st, they deliver February or March, right? Which is not a huge deal, but you know, people are, are expecting a, a certain date. And a lot of times I would say 70, 60% of times is not delivered exactly the same date that the developer said, right? And as far as the specifications, you know, like finishes or even size of the unit, that happens a little bit. But what I tell people when buying a pre-sale is you're buying something that is going to be 20, 25, 30% cheaper and less expensive than what it is when they deliver it to you, right? So you have to be a little bit open to minor things happening, right? Uh, a lot of times the developer changes the cutters or changes the palette or changes the materials. And the developer a lot of times doesn't do that because they're scheming or, or saving money. A lot of times they don't do that because of that. But just within a year of pre-construction timeframe, materials are available or they're not and things like that. So they have to change things. And a lot of people, a lot of times people don't like it, right? However, in the, in the big scheme of things, in the big perspective of your investment, it doesn't make a huge difference. The difference in colors or the difference in materials, it doesn't make a big difference. So a lot of times we don't encounter, to be honest with you, we haven't encountered big issues, you know, like uh, uh, developers running away with money. We've never had that at the office ever. So we've had major issues a lot of times. Taking something that is just drawn in, in a couple of plans and making it into reality, there's always going to be some margin of error. I mean, that's just common sense. And yeah, and there's something irrelevant because at the end of the day, if you see your contract, probably your contract is going to say that you, uh, the, the, the unit is going to be delivered on October the 15th and that you need to title on October the 15th. But at the end of the day, that date is always open to a little bit of, of uh, yeah, negotiation, sort of say. And it actually goes on both ways here. I think it's important to look out at the fact that developers are exposed to a number of things. Like you say, like, okay, we were dec deciding to use whatever paint. And then the, the, the supply is not enough for that paint. So you make minor tweaks. So it may be a different shade of white. But at the end of the day, even when you see your contracts, there's like the, the, the memory of qualities. You're going to say that they are using uh, ceramic, whatever, or equivalent, or paint, whatever, or equivalent, because they're protecting the themselves a little bit about these, these flaws in the, in the chain of supply. And at the end of the day, I think it's important to also understand that just as he is exposed, I mean, the developer to having these problems in the, in the chain of supply, as probably you as, as a buyer may have issues here and there about making the payments. And there's something that, 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 that we've spoken every time. And this is something that actually has happened a lot when there's a payment due again, October the 15th and the client calls and say, Hey man, I have some issue. Why, whatever, this is my daughter's wedding, whatever. And so they need to make the payment a couple of days after. And 
more often, there's no penalties. I mean, whenever there's a, a channel of communication, I want to say that we're going to be okay. But yeah, as you say, these little tweaks or these little differences are not a catastrophic flaw. I mean, a, a lighter shade of blue is not going to make a difference when it comes to your vacation rentals or your own comfort. For some people it is, right? Some people are like, I want an exactly that tone of color, right? Some people are like that, right? So that's why I advise people, whenever you're entering to a pre-sale, just be a bit flexible. Exactly, because I think that's the trade up. I mean, that's exactly the trade off. You're entering the market 30% down the price. Well, you, you should cope with these tiny little tweaks here and there. I mean, I mean, in the long run, you're making a lot of money, even if the paint is not exactly the one that you like. I mean, if, if the case is that you want to explore everything to the last detail and that the painting is exactly the one that you want and that the tone of the wood is exactly the one that you want, then you would be in a different scenario, in the scenario of buying something already built, but you would be missing the business of the presale. For sure. So uh, what we encounter is that what you were saying one minute ago is really interesting. Just as you as a buyer have a minor mishaps in the payments and things like that, and you're a lot of times you're asking the developer, please wait for me a little bit because I have a problem with the bank or whatever. That is the exact same kind of problems that he's encountering with. And probably times 10 because the developer has to uh, manage a lot of different things, right? Permits and materials and, and payrolls and things like that, right? So you kind of have to be a little bit flexible because things don't go exactly the way they were meant to a lot of times, right? And the developers are a bit flexible in, in those terms, right? You call a developer and you say, you know what, I tried to pay $10,000 by the beginning of this month and I'm not going to be able to, I'm going to wire you 5000 and then 5000 at the end of the month. 99.9% of the times the developer is going to be fine with that, a bit flexible. No developer is in the business of, of profiting out of penalties, really. So if you're going to be late a couple of days, yeah, he's not going to do anything, really. As long as I said, as long as there's a, a communication channel, nothing's going to go back. Yeah, so you were asking if, if I've heard a lot of cases going really bust, right? Not really. Like at the office, we've made probably, I don't know, 500 different pre-sale uh, contracts during the time that we've been open. And we've never tried to chase the developer because they're right away with uh, people's money. It's never happened. It's happened that there's things that you have to fix and people are really upset. Yeah, I'm going to be very upset. Sometimes people are really upset. One time it happened to me that the tone of the, of the wood in the renders was really light and the developer changed that for something a, a, a bit darker and, and they really hated it. So things happen. Our job as agents is to, you know, nowadays uh, uh, what we do is we actually, I mean, if there's 300 different developers in the area, we deal with 10. We don't deal with 300. We deal with 10. We cannot know very well 300 of them. We don't. So. We deal with 10 of them. We know them really well. We know their curriculum. We know how they work. We know their past and we know their present. We know them well. And that's who we work with. That's pretty much it. Are they perfect? No, they're not perfect, but they, they're never going to run away with people's money. I mean, far away from that. And, and they actually deliver on time what people are expecting. So that really cuts a lot of our risk, right? Uh, just dealing with people that we know really well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in my case, I think that the most dramatic case that I've ever encountered was, you may or may not remember, it was the mom and her son that the developer was taking a little bit too late. And honestly, they started getting worried and us were started getting worried. And at the end, we just sat on a negotiation table. Uh, the developer offered a little discount and a little compensation. And uh, we were renegotiated that contract. And honestly, everything went fantastic. I mean, at the end of the result was great. The buyers, they saved some money. The, the developer got the time that he needed. And so at the end, yeah, the, the delivery took a little bit longer than we could have expected. And in this, I want to be very punctual is the only case that I can, that I can quote because I don't know. I was speaking with, with, with a client earlier this week and, and, and she said that, no, like I, I've heard a lot of cases in which the developer runs with the money. And to be fair, and, and this is not because this is my business, it's just based on my experience. And trust me, my friends, I'm being absolutely transparent and honest in this one. I cannot, I cannot quote one example. I mean, I can think of uh, one big developer like 10 years ago that, again, was taking too long, but at the end, the buyers were compensated and the developer, where well, the development was built. So let's say that all together things went well. But that actually brings me to the second thing that we're going to, to, to be talking uh, today, which has, uh, has to do with the limitations for an individual to buy a property in the Riviera Maya, no? Because that's what you're saying. When someone, you know, from the States, from Canada, whatever, goes down, they're going to be facing a universe 
of, of offering. You're going to see signs everywhere. You're going to see uh, the developments being built everywhere. And so I would say that the big, big, big uh, kind of mistake that you can make is to try to bypass the brokers. You, you mentioned something, Alex, that at the end, we do our homework from the universe of developers that can be 300 and even more because there are so many. The idea is here, our job as real estate agents or as a real estate company is to pick those that will offer the best, uh, the best service. And by best service, I mean prompt deliveries and according to specifications. And in general, a good service. Not that if you have a question, they would ask, I answer and all of that. But yeah, you as an individual, you're going to be facing a lot of things. So I, I'm going to even there to say that if there are actually cases in which someone gets into a scam, most likely, and, and I have no statistics for that, but that's my, my educated guess, that most likely that person was not receiving the, the right advisory from, from a real estate broker. What do you think? Well, for sure. Like, uh, uh, probably it's not just that, right? Probably the majority of the responsibility lied on the broker, right? Like, didn't you know that this guy wasn't legit? You know what I mean? Because, yeah, just like you, I've heard of things. I've heard of developments running away with money. I've heard of them, honestly, you know? Now, it's just that the, the huge minority, you know, it, it doesn't happen that much. You know, uh, the developers are here because they have a background, a lot of them, at least the ones we work with, uh, they have a background and they know what they're doing and their intention is to deliver well and make money and continue making money and more developments. You know what I mean? So uh, that's the people that we work with. There's things all over. So we, we've had a case, I don't know if you remember, like five years ago, this, this American guy that called us, but then he, he started just walking around and knocking at people's doors and getting to know the ball person. And in the end, he, he entered a, he encountered a huge scam. And what, I don't know, but, you know, like uh, it's, it's a good business to, to develop here. So a lot of developers from all over the world come here and they think it's just easy. And a lot of times I guess they, these scams are not meant to be scams from the beginning. They just uh, become scams because the developer didn't have anything else to do. He didn't uh, uh, manage his project well, so he had to fly, right? And, and that happened. So the best thing is to do my filter with the broker that I choose, with the agent that I choose. I'm going to see if they're actually legit and they're certified and they're honest and they're telling me the truth. If that happens, I'm going to let them assist me. And, and that doesn't mean I'm not going to do my due diligence or see other options or things like that. But I'm, I'm going to let them gauge the market for me and tell me what a good option is, right? Like if I was investing in Miami, for example, it doesn't matter if I'd been to Miami 50 times, I'm not, I'm not an expert of the market, right? So I'm going to let myself be guided through, through a process with a broker. So uh, uh, a lot of limitations come from that. You know, if you're a buyer and you want to bypass an agent, what is the universe of the bonds that you can access to? It's, it's really limited, right? And a lot of times you're going to be encountering the guys that don't have the, the infrastructure or don't have the expertise, right? And a lot of times it happens. Yeah, you know, as a matter of fact, I, I've made a couple of more videos about how to select a good broker and also about how to mitigate the rate, the risk of pre-sales. And again, I think what you're saying is, is very important. It doesn't mean to just put yourself, you know, blindly in the hands of someone. But in reality, I think we, since this is our, our job, we have access to a lot of more information and sometimes a lot of uh, information that is not out there. We have access to a lot of back channels like WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups or but where, where you hear the gossip, then it's really up to you to see if it's true or not. But at the end of the day, you can hear and kind of measure just the waters as for which developer you should be working with. And again, I mean, if you need to choose a right, uh, a right broker, ask for a license, ask for experience, ask for if he knows developers, if he knows the, the things around the, the whole business, let's say like notaries and lawyers and all of that, a, a broker should know all of those things. And as for developers, I've said it. If they have an office, if they have a showroom, if they have previous uh, properties delivered, those things should be indicators that you're going in the right place. But nonetheless, and this, my friends, I strongly suggest that you get the, the advisory of a certified real estate agent, because honestly, we don't want you to be the next uh, story that we can attract by the way, but we don't want you to be the next uh, failure story out of receiving a poor uh, advisory. Yeah, yeah. We see that a lot, right? We don't see a lot of uh, buyers being scammed, but we see a lot of buyers that were not advised properly, that they call the office and they go like, I want to resell my property. And it sounds like a normal thing. But when you ask them uh, exactly what happened, which is our job, like, what are you selling? 
A lot of times you see that there are risks trying to get out of the property because they, they weren't given the right expectation, right? So if we could wrap this up, but don't, what I would say is just like anywhere else, do your due diligence, but trust someone and, and do a filter. A lot of times we ask the, the clients, can we do a Zoom call? And they think uh, uh, we want to do a Zoom call because we want to pressure them and say, hey, come on, I want to look at you in your face and, and, and tell you, are you going to do this or you're not going to do that? Don't waste my time or something like that, right? Like we're going to do a hard sale or something. And it's not because of that. We, we want them to see your faces and we want them to do our, uh, their due diligence about us, choose a broker, be a good filter, ask them questions and see if they are actually uh, 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 being legit with you. They're telling you the truth of things in general, not just about them, but about the market and about, and about the, the, the market in general. What I mean, uh, about, and, and we can expand about this subject probably for hours. If you ask a broker right now, how was last year? They'll say, amazing. It was amazing. It was booming. You have to buy right now. And a lot of times that's not exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you need to stay realistic. And I want to say, this is something that, that just came into mind. I want to say that an educated investor has to know his limitations. So I would say that step, step one of your due diligence has to do with finding a, a broker that you can trust and that can provide you with reliable information. In that case, that's where we come in. But at the end of the day, there are thousands of brokers. You can choose whichever you want. And so, but yeah, I would say that the first stage is acknowledging that you cannot uh, go to the Riviera Maya one week or two, and in that time frame, learn everything that is to be learned about the real estate market in the Riviera Maya. So you necessarily depend on a real estate broker. And the first due diligence is to find the right one for you. As for all, as all of the questions that you need, because at the end, that's going to give you a lot of reassurance. And once that you're in good hands, honestly. I don't see why you could get into a scam or you could get into a flawed uh, business or, or whatnot. Acknowledging that there's always going to be uh, differences in deliveries that are not catastrophic. But as long as you're open to that and understand how the pre-sale market works, you're going to be in good hands. Yeah. And if you're watching this podcast, for sure, you're in the right track. You're, you're doing your due diligence. You're, you're trying to understand a bit more of how things work. So Absolutely. So my friends, this is the time that we have for today. And so if you want to learn about anything else, just make sure to leave it in your comments and we can explore that that subject in, in the next uh, upcoming uh, podcast. So thank you, my friends. Alex, thank you for your time. And to the next one.